We've gone over many rules of the Fourier transform properties like the shift rule, the multiplication rule, convolution rule, time scaling rule. Um, I'm now, and these rules can all be found in lists, in your textbooks, and so forth. I'm going to go over one more rule here, the conjugate rule. And it says that the, um, says that if you take the conjugate of a signal and you take its Fourier transform, then the, the result can be expressed in terms of the Fourier transform of the original signal X. It's going to just be the conjugate of capital X, except for you're also going to have to put a negative F. You're going to flip it in frequency. Okay. Now, we already have a rule about time scaling that says that if you flip one of these in time, it's the same as flipping the other one in time. So, equivalently, we could say this, the conjugate of negative t. So, if we take the conjugate and flip it in time, then we just get the conjugate in frequency. Okay, these are the same rule, we're just applying time shifting, but that now you see it in a symmetric form. Um, so that, you know, either one of these is correct and they both, there's some nice symmetry here. Um, I would like to uh, justify this rule and then we'll look at some implications. So the proof of this property is pretty simple. Let's say, let's start with this here. We have x conjugate of f is equal to, well, it's the conjugate of the Fourier transform of x, right? Negative infinity to infinity x of t e to the minus i 2 pi f t dt. That is x of f. We've conjugated it. Now, conjugates move into sums or integrals. So we can do integral and just take a conjugate of what's inside. And, whoops, take the dt out. And, um, and now the conjugates split. When you have a product, it becomes a conjugate of each. So it's x conjugate of t e to the, and now the conjugate of this exponential is just going to be make the exponent positive rather than negative. Okay, we're almost there. Now, well, I want, I do want that negative in the exponent, so I'm going to do a double negative in the exponent. I'll put a negative in front, and I'll make it negative t. And I'll do a change of variables, u equals negative t. Okay, so u equals negative t is going to get this type of thing. It's going to be, all right, it's going to be um, uh, infinity to negative infinity x conjugate of u, oops, of negative u, e to the negative i 2 pi f u d u. Ah, except for du equals negative dt, so I have to put a negative out front. Okay, good. Negative, we'll just go into this limits of this integral, so we get integral from negative infinity to infinity. Negative u into negative i 2 pi u du equals the Fourier transform of x conjugate of negative t. All right, it's just u happens to be the variable I'm using for integration there. So we verified that second step. Now, on to something more interesting. That is the implications of this rule. So notice, if x of t is real. By the way, all of th this rule holds in discrete time as well. Let's put that here. Also, so it's continuous time and discrete time, although I'm just giving the proof and statement for continuous time. Okay, if x of t is real, what does that mean? That means that x of t equals x conjugate of t. Therefore, that means that x of f equals x conjugate of negative f. And we call this conjugate symmetry. So this is something you've noticed and we've talked about over and over um, with 
the Fourier transforms of real uh, real signals is that they have the symmetry property in the frequency domain. When we first noticed the symmetry property, we we um, it was because we were saying that if you have a real signal, it's made of of sinusoids, then you need conjugate pairs of complex exponentials in order for the imaginary parts to cancel out. So for any positive frequency there must be an equally large negative frequency of just the right phase and that's what this conjugate has is for so that their imaginary parts cancel. That's exactly what we're noticing here. There are other things to notice as well. If instead of just saying it's real, let's say um, Oh, actually, okay, let's let's do if x is imaginary. This is some something you'll encounter much less, but I just want to get these properties out there. If it's imaginary, then uh, x of t equals negative x conjugate of t. Therefore, you would have the opposite sort of symmetry. x of f would equal negative x conjugate of negative f. All right. Now we have something more interesting. I'm going to split x, and so any number can be split into real and imaginary parts, and furthermore, any signal can be split into even and odd parts, as we saw early on in, the, in this course. So therefore, x of t can be split actually into real even, real odd, imaginary even, and imaginary odd parts. Let's look at what would happen to each one. If x of t is real and even, then we know x of t equals x conjugate of t, that's because it's real, but this equals x of negative t, and furthermore, that's going to be x conjugate of negative t, so all of these things are equal. Alright, so in the frequency domain, that's x of negative f equals x of f. Ooh, that's cool. This part was just because it's even. This is even. So if it's even, the, even in time, it's even in frequency as well. All right? And because it's real, that's going to be x conjugate of negative f, which is going to equal x conjugate of f. And now we notice all of these equalities, and we say, oh, my gosh, it's also by the conjugate symmetry and the fact that it's even, it's going to be real. Okay, so, if we were real and even, we end up with real and even. That's the bottom line. X of F is real and even. Okay, and we're going to have similar sorts of conclusions. X, let's say, X of T is real and odd. Now we get something interesting if we follow the same logic. We get x of f is, it's not, uh, it's not real. It's imaginary, purely imaginary and odd. And this is a two-way arrow because you could get backwards. If x of f is, so this these are all if and only if. If x, if in the frequency domain you were purely imaginary and odd, then you're odd in time as well, but you're real. You switch from being imaginary to, to real. If x of t is imaginary and odd, that equates to the frequency domain being what? What do you think? Think duality here. Duality means that we should have kind of reverse statements holding. We had imaginary and odd on the right. In the previous statement, we've got imaginary and odd on the left here. So we should have that this is real and odd. And the final one is if x of t is imaginary and even, then we get that x of f is uh, is imaginary 
and even, so no, no change. So the easy way to remember what's going on here is if it's even, there's no change. It's it, Real parts stay real, imaginary parts stay imaginary. If it's odd, then it flips. Real parts become imaginary, imaginary parts become real. Now, it's not going to be that frequent that your signal is one of these four characteristics, right? So we could label these one, two, three, four. Not necessarily that your signal is going to be that, but your signal, any signal, can be decomposed into four parts, each having one of these properties. So in general, x of t is going to equal, let's say, x that's real and even, plus a signal that's real and odd, plus a signal that's imaginary and e even, plus a signal that's imaginary and odd. Okay, you can always decompose it that way. We have formulas for how to do that. And then x of f will also decompose into those four. And if I write them in a different order, real even, plus, I'm not going to write it in the same order. I'm going to say x, um, what needs to go here? Uh, imaginary odd, x imaginary even, and x real odd. Okay, so I decompose it in frequency, decompose it in time, and these match up. These are Fourier transforms of each other. That is a Fourier transform. That is a Fourier transform pair. And that is a Fourier transform pair. So these components each contribute to one part. Let me put that as a one-way arrow each contribute to one part of the Fourier transform. Okay, so these parts kind of stay separate from each other.